you guys are comp climbing fans, so you know what it's like to not have somebody to talk about your favorite hobby with. The debrief may be dead, but let's try doing this thing solo. Before we get into it, Madison Richardson with that seventh place, a new personal best for one of Canada's upstart boulderers every year, getting better and better. And in the spirit of getting better and growth and team support, maybe you would consider supporting Canada's paraclimbing team. They want to go to the Salt Lake City Paraclimbing World Cup this year, and they're trying to raise funds with a 50-50 draw. So maybe you want to spend 10 bucks or 20 bucks, get some tickets. The money goes directly to Canada's paraclimbing team, and you may just win your money back. Link right down in the description below. All right, I've never done one of these solo before. We're going to keep it short. We're going to keep it tight. And I figure we should start with a bit of a recap. And I want to start with the boys. Both genders had a bit of an Achilles heel uh, at this World Cup. I should say we're talking about Kachow. I'm calling it Kachow because it sounds like a, like a Batman punch, but I think it's a little bit different. You can leave the pronunciation in the comments if you know how to type pronunciations. For the boys, their Achilles heel was the weather. The women narrowly escaped having one of their boulders rained out in qualification, but the men got absolutely rogered by it and qualifications was canceled partway through the round. That meant across the week, they only had time for two men's rounds. Then it ended up being a second try of qualifications and then semifinals. What does that mean? Well, it means you've got the two least viewable competition formats being broadcast to the public, led to a lot of confusion and just not that great a time watching the World Cup, even though the field was actually really good. Almost all of the biggest names in bouldering were there. It was great to see where they were at after a long break, although things were a little bit confusing because after your break, you don't quite know where you are. And particularly in the Olympic season where everybody's trying to peak at different times, there was a lot of disparity from what you might've expected from many of these athletes. After a couple hard rounds, it ends up being Tomoe Narasaki back on top, winning his, I think it was his uh, ninth tier one gold medal. So that's world championships and world cups combined. Second place, the rookie from last year, Serato and Raku. And in third place, Hannes van Dyssen, who was a bit of a breakout last year. He gets another bronze medal like he did at the start of 2023. Now, the rain's disappointing, but it was also kind of funny because, as you may have heard a lot of chatter on the internet, it was held in, or this World Cup was held in a really impressive new build stadium that was purposefully built for climbing. I don't think it has any other purpose. It's gorgeous. It's something you'd want to take photos of, and it's especially great in drone shots. But all of that goes to waste when there's a huge hole in the roof. And even with their little backup tent, they had to cancel an entire round. It's not the only place that rain happens, and it's not the only World Cup that happens in an outdoor venue, so I don't want to, like, overemphasize how weird or how disappointing this particular event was, but it is a lot funnier when it's in a venue that must have cost far too much money for having to cancel rounds inside of it. And even funnier when you've got like the lost cause, grouchy old timers still bring it up. Myringen, the former first stop of every World Cup season, and may have been located in a tiny town in, you know, the backwater of Switzerland where there was almost like more cows than there were people. But even for a shabby little like tennis hall, the crowd was amazing and never once did the competition get rained out. On the women's side, they didn't have to deal with rain, thank goodness, but they also didn't have much of the field, unfortunately. Popular names like Brooke Rabatou, Natalia Grossman, Oriane Berton, they just weren't there. And that meant it was pretty obvious from the start it was gonna be another coronation for the leading boulderer of our time, Yanya Garnbrett. Qualifications, some might say one section or one group was a little easy, but semifinals was nails hard. And that meant that some of the names we thought would come up through into finals, like Miho Nanaka, Hannah Moyle, Stasi Gejo, they couldn't quite cut it in that really hard semifinals round. So we got a really interesting field in finals of, frankly, tier three bouldering talent, not people you would expect to win. And for the most part, names that wouldn't necessarily expect to even make the finals cut in a regular competition. As it played out, Yanya, of course, takes the win in second place is Italian Camilla Maroni for, I think, her second World Cup medal. She got a she got a medal at World Champs uh, last year. And then Zhilu Lo of China 
honestly just nice and cool that you get somebody from the home country getting a medal at all. Uh, but like I said, a bit of a coronation and probably by my analysis, the easiest gold medal that Yanni Garmbret has been able to win since Munich 2019, when if you remember in semifinals, Yanni Garmbret got four tops, which was four times as many tops in semifinals as the rest of the field combined. There were other 19 climbers total could summon a single top between them. So this is what I'm talking about when it was a bit of a coronation and maybe like tier three climbers made it to finals. It's pretty rare you get a win this easy, but Yanya took it and she made it entertaining. And frankly, the other climbers did too. Root setters did a good job of keeping the climbs diverse through all three rounds. And that meant we got to see some good from everybody. But Yanya made it look great. She made it look easy and another win under her belt in Kichau. With that recap out of the way, I figured I might just try and talk about three things after every competition. So here's my three, and I promise I'm getting to what I talked about in the thumbnail. Obviously, the podium, the legends that she she beat for the podium were not here at this event. None of the people she beat in finals were legends just yet. Uh, but first topic I want to bring up is what's being called the World Climbing Club, which is a series of short videos the IFSC is putting out, kind of replacing what they previously would have called like bouldering highlights or like finals highlights, semifinals highlights. This is a winner. Their old highlight videos were generally not interesting, didn't show as many highlights as people wanted. I think in a highlights video, people want to be able to see all the tops from all the climbers that they're interested in. And the videos they used to do never managed to achieve that. Instead, they show a brief bit of highlight and then they get Matt Groom out in with the climbers, in with coaches, in with root setters, in with officials. And this is Matt Groom at his best because he brings out the best in whoever he talks to. That's probably his biggest talent as an on-air personality is making people comfortable, keeping things cheerful and making everybody seem likable and charismatic. It's increasing the brand of the athletes and everybody else that he talks to. And it's increasing his own brand himself. I'm a huge fan of these videos. I think highlights and recaps should be left to YouTubers like me who do that kind of stuff for free. The YouTube pirates who like just re repost the entire finals, leave it to those people if you want to like cut out the fat and just do highlights of particular climbs. But if you're Matt Groom and you have that personality and you have that voice and you have that demeanor with other people that you interview, and most importantly, if you have access, if you are at every comp and you're in isolation and you're in the commentary booth, I'm so happy that he's getting to use those opportunities to show us these short, like 10 minute magazine style collections of content that open up angles we never got to see before. It is the best thing that Matt Groom has brought to IFSC broadcast so far. And for that, congratulations to him and to the IFSC broadcast team. One of the other points I wanted to bring up, uh, Olympic training cycles are gonna make this a mess First World Cup of the season, it's pretty normal to expect that no one knows what to expect. The climbers don't know where they, where they are at on World Cup boulders. The climbers don't know where each other are at on World Cup boulders. And the root setters really don't know where the climbers might be at. So first comp's always shaky. Things might be too hard, too easy. Climbers aren't performing the way they want to be. But making it even worse this year is that you have athletes trying to peak at entirely different times. Yanni Garnbrett is trying to peak for the Olympics towards the end of the summer, whereas others are trying to peak for the OQS just a couple months away. And then as just a complete wild card, you've got those tier three, tier four climbers who are never gonna go to the OQS, so the World Cups are all they have. And this might be their pinnacle series and maybe overperforming the rest of them. At this comp, we heard climbers talking about not caring about the results at this comp, not caring about the series overall, not quite feeling very good for strength or for endurance and feeling like they're training lead more than boulders or this, that, and the other thing. It made things pretty disorienting in terms of the status of other climbers, and it's only going to make this season even more confusing. From a historical lens, whoever ends up on top of this season, who ends up on the bottom, there are going to be so many asterisks in terms of the diversity of the field and what everybody's goals were. It's going to be incredibly hard to parse. And that's part of why I wanted to do these videos is to add a little bit of context of who is where and when and why. Last thing I want to talk about, end on a high note, talking about Yanya Garnbrett knocking a legend off the podium. And of course, I'm not talking about somebody in finals from this weekend because she was the only legend on that podium. I wanted to talk about female boulders over the history of competitive climbing, specifically over World Cup climbing. So we're starting in 1999. 
there are a bunch of greats in bouldering and you may not know the names, but we're talking like Anna Stur, we're talking Akio Noguchi, we're talking Sandrine LeVay, and we're talking people like Yanya Garnbred and maybe, you know, Natalia Grossman coming up. What was special about this week's competition in Kachau was Yanni Garnbret overtook the early 2000s bouldering and lead legend, French climber Sandrine LeVay. In bouldering specifically, Sandrine LeVay had accumulated 18 bouldering medals, that's World Cups and World Championships, 18 medals in her career, almost all of those in the early mid 2000s. She was an excellent lead climber as well, which is what makes her one of the few athletes in history that you can properly compare to somebody like Yanya, because most of the great climbers, almost all of the legends of climbing were single discipline climbers. And so trying to compare Yanya Garnbret to an Anna Stor, who was a bouldering specialist, or to Jane Kim, who was a lead specialist, it's very hard to do because they're competing in pretty much different realms and not many people have done what Yanya does of bouldering and lead at a high level at the same time. But Sandrine LeVay was one of those people and at the end of her career, she had accumulated 18 boulder gold medals. And at this event, Yanya ticked to 19 putting her now in third place for the most Boulder gold medals in their career. Anna Storr is still at the top with 24. Akio Noguchi, this graph is a little unclear. I'm going to annotate it so you can read it. Uh, Akio Noguchi, I think, is at 21 or 22, if I remember right. So we might get to see uh, Yanya Garnbret overtaking both of them over the next couple of years. Now, Yanya already announced the rest of her plans for at least the pre-Olympic part of the 2024 season. She told us she's doing Kachau, which is what we just finished. She's going on to Wujang, happening in the next couple of days. And then Innsbruck will be her last World Cup before the Olympics uh, in the summer. And so she's only gonna have one more opportunity to win a Boulder Gold this year. So she's not gonna overtake anybody else on the Boulder Gold medals chart uh, this season at the very least. But next season, we'll see how much she wants to compete. She could end up taking that top spot if we get the right number of comps and she has the right kind of season. To finish up, I thought I would go over the rankings. Maybe we'll do this after every comp, but we'll update you on the World Cup rankings to maybe emphasize a little bit of that season long story, even though this year the rankings are gonna be an absolute shit show. And an extra reason why they might be a bit of a shit show before I actually show them is this, at least in the Boulder World Cup and the Speed World Cup, we're currently scheduled to have only five events or less, five Boulder events and five Speed events in 2024 and there is a special rule in the rule book which says if you have five events or less in one of the world cup series that means you don't get to ditch your lowest score for your season end ranking like you normally do when you have six events or more so for those of you that are nerdy and you already know how the rankings work and you're used to seeing a climber have six competitions and whatever your lowest score is you drop it or more commonly, there's six events on the calendar, but athletes might skip one because they can drop whatever their lowest score is. So if you skip one of those comps, it's a zero, you just get to drop it out because the rule says if there's six events or more, you drop one score. Not gonna happen this year. Every single score counts, and that means every time you're absent also counts. So keep that in mind as we look at the rest of these rankings for the Boulder World Cup after this first event of 2024. Yanni Garnbret won the comp, so she's in first place with 1,000 points, followed up by Italian Camilla Moroni and Chinese climber Gilou Lo. Part of the French dynasty, Zelia Avazu is in fourth place, and upstart British climber Aaron McNeese is in fifth. Anon Matsufuji, currently the highest ranked Japanese climber so far, is in sixth. Madison Fisher, the Canadian I already spoke about, earning her personal best ever, seventh. Chloe Collier of Belgium in eighth. Stasha Geo with a disappointing start in ninth place. And Australian Oceana McKenzie returning to the top 10 uh, to round out the rankings after Kichau. For the men, Japanese superstar Tomoe Narasaki is in first with his protege Serato Raku in second. Belgian Hannes van Doysen is in third, Toby Roberts from Great Britain in fourth, and Sam Avazu in fifth. Meichi Narasaki of Japan in sixth place, Zhang Wanshan in seventh, legend Jakob Schubert in eighth place, Andrzej Pehartz from Slovenia is in ninth, tied with Jan Luka Posch and Max Milne of Austria and Great Britain. And that's it for this untitled recap. 
list of takeaways discussion about the Kachau bouldering world cup in 2024 let me know if you have any suggestions for the next one and if you are looking for somebody to talk about these comps to because you're watching alone on your laptop eating like popcorn and stuff in bed in the middle of the night join the plastic weekly discord no matter what round it is no matter what time of day it is no matter where in the world it is if there is an ifsc world cup happening our Discord is talking about it. So join in, come chat with me and the rest of the squad as we talk about the Wujang Lead and Speed World Cup. And of course, subscribe to this channel for more content. Talk to you guys in the next one.